We're live, Joe and Mike, buildassetsonline.com. You thought we were gone. I, I saw the comments. They're like, why, why, flopped. Why'd you guys stop making videos? I mean, the truth really, is- Really, were we getting those? Yeah, we got a few of those. We got a few of those. The people need constant, constant uh, fodder. I mean, Mike, the truth is, is that's what they're getting. Because <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't looked at what goes on with dropshipping on YouTube for quite a while. So I logged in today, you know, just, just to see what was going on. And you're right. That's all it is. It's just fodder. It's like high visual effects, 4K cameras, but really no useful information coming out of the mouths of the people behind the cameras. Let's just, let's just say that much. Yeah. It's free samples. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, you go to Costco, those, you get some pretty good free samples, but yeah, I mean, it, it, how much could you talk about with dropshipping every day? But realistically, you know, you, you took a nice leave of absence there, hung out in our mom's basement for a bit, but we're still drop shipping. We're taking massive action. And that's what people don't understand is that we're actually doing other things. This is like, it's equal, I guess, but it, it's got a, it's got its place. This isn't, this isn't the only way that we uh, make a living by talking to the masses, but yeah, if people are in here, please uh, let us know. Let yeah. us know what's up. And supposedly we're live yeah. on, on Twitter, Mike. So what, what's what's going on with that? I don't know. I'm going to try and check it, but my... Um... Oh, I see it. I see it. We're live with zero viewers. Yeah, I mean, I got no followers on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Okay. And Look, we got, a, can, uh, we got a question from Danielle. He says, I've been waiting <laughs> for y'all's lives. I have lots of questions. Well, you feel free to ask those questions because we're, we're here to answer them. We do want to start with the core topic, which is realistic results for high ticket dropshipping for complete beginners. And so why don't we kick it off with that? And in the meanwhile, you guys can drop some messages in the chat and ask your questions and we'll get to them. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to them at the end. So realistic results, first time dropshippers, beginners, Joe, are, you're breaking up a little bit, I think. Can someone confirm if Joe's uh, video is coming through good? It's, you keep freezing for me. I don't know if it's me or if it's... Um... it's. I'm sure it's not coming out that way on the stream. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, people in the chat can let us know and I'll, I'll take a look what's going on. Anyway. Sorry. Sorry, there's some technical difficulties. All right. You're a beginner, Joe. You're about to start dropshipping. What's what's realistic? Can you get to 100k a month? I think you could easily get 100K. to 100. I think if you have a roadmap to follow, getting to like 100k a month in two three months is really realistic. Now, will every beginner be able to do that? Absolutely not. Because what I've learned from you know interacting with so many students is that. Everyone has differing, ca differing capabilities for sure. And you, you just have some people that are, you know, real wizards. They get stuff up fast. They take action really fast. And then you have some people that maybe they don't work as fast. Maybe they have a lot going on in real life, or maybe they're just not as savvy, you could say. But yeah, I think it just, it just depends on your capabilities and, I mean, that's kind of a boring answer, I guess, but. Well, I think really if you, if you back out from the hundred K, what does it take to make a hundred thousand in sales in a month? No matter what, it takes a certain amount of traffic. You can't optimize your way to a hundred K. Right. You're going to need, you're going to need a certain amount of visitors. Right. And with paid ads, it's a lot more predictable in terms of, you know, getting a return. Right. So if you're going to make a hundred K. We've seen students get, you know, I was talking with a student the other day that was getting 40 X his return on ad spend, meaning he gets, if he spends a thousand dollars in ads, he'll do 40,000 in revenue. That's extremely high. That's not something you see often. We've seen 20 times return on ad spend. And what, what is, so, what, what was so special about what he was doing? Would you say, um, 
I call it luck. Okay. Uh, you, you see sometimes in s people when they just get started and their spend is lower, you get a much higher return on ad spend. Yeah. I think it's just kind of the, the nature of the beast because if your traffic is low, it usually means you're bidding pretty low. And because you're bidding low, you make big sales, you get, you get a big return on it. But you, you, you can't stay stuck in that forever because you want to be generating a higher revenue overall. Like if you get 40 X return on ad spend, but your revenue is only 40,000, it's good, but I'd rather have a lower return on ad spend, but, but, but be making 400,000, you know? Yeah, definitely. So, so luck. I'd luck, but also when you're bidding lower and you're in a beginning stage, a, a higher return on ad spend. I, I've seen it happen plenty of times. But 20x return on ad spend, you put in a dollar, you put in $1,000 in ad spend, your revenue is 20000 That's That's good. That's above average, I'd say. And it, it's realistic too. So we've done that you know, across our, our highly, highly scaled ad accounts. But as a worst case, Predictably, we could see we've seen students do at least 10x return on ad spend. So they put in a thousand, right. their revenue is 10,000. So they would this need, way, they would need to put in 10,000 to get to 100,000. Exactly. Exactly. And that usually, the 10x number usually works out pretty good in terms of your um, profit margins when it comes to high ticket dropshipping because you're going to get at least, you know, 20% margin is, is, is good. Sometimes you get less if they're not a great supplier, but you're usually not um, dipping below 10% margin on a dropshipping product. If that's the case, right. you have a bad supplier. Right. So, yeah. So long winded way to say, if you can spend 10,000 in a month and spend it in the right places, not just throw it at the wall, but you know, in the strategies we discuss a hundred, a hundred thousand in revenue is pretty realistic to achieve right and say you know you only make 10 percent margin after ad spend after what the product costs you're looking at ten thousand dollars a month profit which it's nothing to sneeze at really right but the reason beginners don't do this is number one they're scared because they probably don't have maybe ten thousand dollars to lose or maybe they do have ten thousand dollars but they're scared they're going to lose it. They don't want to lose it. And people like to, you know, they want to dip their toe in. So it's not, it's not realistic to see somebody spend that much out the gate. And I probably wouldn't advise them to unless they had some previous experience because they're likely just going to mess things up. Like when we talk with students, they just start their ad account. You go in there, things are usually messed up. And after we, you know, correct some things on a call, whatever, they fix it. They usually see sales pretty soon thereafter, or even they're making a lot of sales before we even correct anything. And that's kind of what is great about high ticket dropshipping is that it is realistic that you could screw up like 80% of things and still be profitable. So we're on Wayfair, Joe. Yeah, we're on Wayfair. You know, I was just kind of, again, trying to back out from that $100,000 number and look for some potential products that, you know, say we, we need to sell a certain amount of them to, to hit that mark. And it's funny that, you know, we always talk about slop sinks, which I guess in this case, people probably search for this with like laundry sink. They don't probably search for the slop sink. They probably search for laundry sink. So it's interesting um, that I landed on this. But yeah, I'm just looking yeah, at so this, which is I mean, many, pr pretty inexpensive, but I'm trying to, I'm now I'm trying to look for some stuff that could complement the, the slop sink. The slop sink. Yeah. Well, Joe, give me one minute. I think the reason you're breaking up is because I'm connected to the wrong internet. Okay. I'm so plugged yeah. in, but I might, I might go blurry for a second. So. Okay. BRB. So yeah, I'm just trying to think. So a lot of these uh, laundry room sinks are not as high ticket as I would I would want for a product. You know, I would want to see things over a thousand dollars, but I believe that 
okay, I'm back. It's, this is just this is just a good place to start. If we think about other stuff that could be in a laundry room, we could definitely supplement these sinks with with other expensive things. And nowadays, actually, I'm just gonna pull up, pull up this on my phone real quick. I love asking Chat GPT for ideas. So, you know, my first thought is, what is expensive in a laundry room? Uh, obviously, you go to the washer and dryer and whatever but i'm sure there's some other things that people keep in the laundry room that would be a good compliment to like slop sinks yeah ask ask chat gpt in the meantime let me uh chat with some of these npcs i'm just kidding uh, you're not npcs but bug bite remover says that the video is good aaron all right joe you're yeah it was me it was me that was messed up hello mr uh or mrs and Yeti. Thank you, Game Control. Yeah, I had to uh, redo the background a little bit. The chat, GPT is hitting me with a couple different ideas. Laundry sorter. I don't know what that is exactly. You might have to Google that. Um, laundry sink. Ironing system. Oh, oh here so, you yeah, the, uh, the videos will be active later as soon as we hang up. Look at that, Joe. Yeah, we got these built-in ironing boards. Just when I was like, you're not going to be able to find anything that's going to go with this. <laughs> you right didn't here. think? I really didn't think. I didn't yeah. think you'd be able to pull it off. Yeah, and I think like that... a Murphy bed, but for irons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And um, I think we could go even deeper than this because, I mean, one of the things I found was laundry pedestals. What is this? Folding hair counter. Drying cabinet. Hold on. <laughs> so this is also a big issue. Uh, when we're talking about realistic results for a beginner. A lot of it has to do with your, I'll say your niche selection, but it, it has it has to do with the way that you angle your store. You need to put yourself in a position where you're not too broad, but you're not too focused in. So you don't just want to be selling, uh, what was the first thing? The slop sinks. The laundry sinks, yeah. But you want to keep a very, very focused set of, t of products that you can sell and you could still be a perceived authority on. If you have slop sinks and then you have what's something totally, and then you have uh, tennis rackets and then you have something else totally unrelated, then you're just going to wind up getting the worst suppliers from whichever things you pick, because there, there's, those are the ones that are not going to really care what your website is about. They're just going to let you in. And now you're going to be, just selling the worst suppliers that are going to have bad margins. They're going to be too competitive. And you're going to say, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm not getting the results that I want, but when people keep a focused set of products, we usually see a lot more um, quick results and a lot more predictable results. <clears throat> so what, was, do think, what do you think about child trafficking? What is, oh yeah. I think this, <laughs> Yeah, this might be that that scandal. How like each of these baskets has a name? Uh, well, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's that. It all has like the same name. I guess. Why, how name. how is this laundry thing a thousand dollars? Yeah, I, I feel like it's just like. I mean, obviously, it was, there was that whole scandal, but look at this. Um, oh yeah, cabinet laundry set. room cabinet set, fourteen hundred. See, now we're getting somewhere, and I feel like look. If someone is going to be redoing their laundry room, you know, back to what you were talking about before with making sure your site is focused on a certain thing, this is how you're going to get more sales. You don't have to necessarily be laundryroom.com, but if you have everything positioned in a way where someone is redoing their laundry room and they need the cabinetry, they need the slop sink, even the washer and dryer maybe. I'm sure there are some brands of washers and dryers that you could drop ship then you could be in a good spot. But now 
I'm seeing this mic, and this could be bringing it in a whole different direction. Hold up. What, where, what are you looking at? I'm looking at this uh, soiled sorting collection card. <laughs> so this is obviously for commercial purposes, which is right. something that we always like to see. But this is this is great. This is great because we took something. I didn't think – I thought we were at a dead end. And we're pulling things out that are residential. They're commercial. They're different product types. This is this is something that's simple. Slop sink, pretty simple. Needs to be maybe installed a little bit, ranging all the way back to um, the 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 Murphy ironing thing. Like you have a you have a variety of different product types in a very very similar niche, serving the same people or slightly different people, and it gives you just a variety of different audiences you're going to be targeting. It yeah. gives you a variety of competitors, meaning if you started a website that was purely slop sinks, every you're, you're, you're basically just competing in that one demographic. You're competing with all the, all the same people. All of a sudden, if you start to get, you know, soiled sorting collection carts, <laughs> you're not really targeting the slop sink audience anymore. Maybe the slop sink stuff isn't the best. There's high CPCs. Every market has different cost per click. So you're going to get different looks as to what performs better, what's easier to sell, what's you screwing up, what's just a very saturated supplier, et cetera. Yeah. So Joe, I actually, I, f I found something very interesting as well. What did you find, Mike? Search, um, search rotary iron. Um, nah. Well, I could just sort Wayfair, by Wayfair might not have it, but basically what I found was, yeah, it's it. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's a rotary iron. Hey, look and... at that right here. Oh, I clicked on. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That. So it's like uh, almost like a sewing machine, but I guess it's like an iron. Like you just roll the clothes through. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, I bet I, I gotta pee. I better go to the bathroom now before we get too deep in. I'll, I'll be back in two seconds. Go Just look take... for some more uh, niches. Yeah. All right, I'll take some questions. We we'll just go over the chats. Martin Duncan said, "Mike, have you ever heard you look like Sean O'Malley from the UFC?" I've never heard that one. People say I look like somebody. It's like every week I get, "Oh, you look like this person," but Sean O'Malley's the first. I don't think I really look like Sean O'Malley. I wish I had Sean O'Malley's hair, though. I would take rainbow hair over uh, over being bold. Yeah, Seam said, paddle boards and slop sinks. And you'd be surprised, man. People will really um, go across the board, like when it comes to making a store. They'll select a whole bunch of different things and then, you know, wonder why they can't get in with certain suppliers or, you know, they're, they're having trouble. Justin says, yo, yo, what's going on, man? We're back, Justin. Berkman asks, hey, guys, when you sell multiple suppliers on a site, if a customer orders two products from two different suppliers, how do they react to receiving two separate shippings orders from the same store? Um, long story short, they, they don't care. I mean, sometimes you order two things from Amazon and they come separately. So it's not really, uh, I haven't never heard a single complaint over half a decade doing what you're describing. So I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, stuff often does come uh, separately. Yeah. I mean, you know, separate boxes sometimes, you know, anything can happen. Martin asks, how's the jiu-jitsu going? It's going pretty good. For me, at least I was at class today, 7 a.m., I haven't gone Getting in. After uh, it. I haven't gone in like a few months, but probably going back in the next couple weeks. Yeah. Is this guy in a gi? I don't think that's him. Okay. I think he used to be in um in our membership. Okay. He had the same profile picture, I believe. Oh anyway, yeah. So a store that does laundry and H HVAC would that be too far off? Well, by HVAC, you mean 
like air conditioning. Like it, it just has to make sense. Like it has to just make common sense. Really. It doesn't have, there's no set formula for it that we can give. If by laundry, you mean you're selling washing machines, you're selling, et cetera, which is not realistic. And you're selling HVAC. Yeah. It makes sense that they're all appliances, right? Like you go to an appliance store, they're going to have all those things, but um, I'll say right now, that's not going to be, you're going to have a hard time getting in with Kenmore and, you know, Samsung, et cetera. So it's not going to be the best niche. You're more better off um, targeting, like if you're going to do laundry, you know, you have this, you have the slop sinks, you have the different iron products we're looking at and um, more kind of uh, off-brand things versus like trying to sell Samsung, Kenmore, LG, et cetera. How important is adding new products and suppliers when sales start coming in? Well, oftentimes it's not important. Meaning when you, when sales are coming in, they're coming in for a brand that you've already added. So the question is, how do I sell more of that brand? And maybe there's a easy path to doing that. Maybe there's not, but when, when we, you know, go on calls with students, usually as a beginner, they're leaving a lot on the table. I mean, even we do it all. Like it takes, it takes years in my opinion to fully optimize um, just one brand because things, you know, it's hard to advertise if they have hundred products or even, you know, 30, 40, it's hard to drive a lot of spend to all those products together. And sometimes you don't, you neglect a product because maybe it just works out that way. And then it, kind of hangs back. And then a few months later, boom, it gets a sale. You make a lot off it. And you say, Hey, I'm really not spending on this product. Okay. Now I got to increase these bids and I got to make text ads for this product, etc." So you're really, you can go on a optimization and, and scaling rabbit hole on just one brand for a long amount of time. Um, but long story short. Yeah. If you, if you're limited by budget in your ad account, I mean, that's just an easy way to instantly get more traffic, get more sales. Um, we go over this in the scaling modules inside of the course. And I know you're uh, you're a member of Game Control, so that's really the most targeted advice I can give. But uh, yeah, I'd say when you're out of ideas, your or your your cost per click is getting high. Like you don't want to keep having to bid more on certain brands that are working, then you can just add more products. Cause again, you get a different look when it comes to audience, it comes to CPC, et cetera. Uh, you got something to say, Joe, before I keep moving on to questions. No, you keep moving on. I think, uh, I think we kind of, these irons, dude. <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I hate how I almost hate doing these cause I almost get shiny object syndrome when I, when I, <laughs> well, we were talking about realistic results, right? Yeah. So let's say you're selling slop sinks, you're selling these expensive irons, whatever. Let's say your average order value is a thousand bucks. It's realistic. Yeah. So that's a hundred sales in a month to get to a hundred thousand. That's around three, three sales a day around that. Three sales a day. So yeah, I mean, if you're spending ten thousand dollars a month on ads, that's about three hundred dollars a day. It takes about for three sales a day, that would be hundred dollars cost per conversion. Right? Yeah. Which again, realistic. Certainly realistic. Uh, but I think people just aren't gonna be willing to spend that much money starting out. So you know, let me see. When we made our first store, we had no idea what we were doing. And it took us a while to even crack 10K. But that's just because we were spending very little. We didn't understand that we had to spend more in order to make more sales. But also, we didn't know how to scale. We didn't, we didn't know how to spend more without losing money. And we were in a very competitive niche. But once we started our second store, I think we did 30K the first month. Yeah. 
And I would say we were still beginners in, in the space. We only been dropshipping for a few months. There was multiple times when every time we started a new store, we were we would kind of say to each other, "Oh, this is how it should be." <laughs> Cuz I remember when we started the last store, the store we have now, we had like a couple sales in a day or like we were our whole thing back then was we had we wanted to have five stores because all we were thinking was like we need to get like one sale a day across the board and then we would be doing good one sale total yeah from all the stores but then when we would make some of them they would get more than that yeah yeah we, we didn't even know what to expect at a certain point we just kept making stores and making stores because that was the only you get a store you make sales so yeah more stores equals more sales that's exactly it we knew how to get the store off the ground and make those <laughs> a couple initial sales so i mean i remember saying to you i was like look we got to do what we did with kindle and just keep putting out books keep putting out stores yeah and so that's yeah that's what happened yeah so at, at that point Doing thirty thousand in a month. I mean, we did that first month on a couple stores. After that, twenty, thirty thousand. And once you do that, I mean, you're really you're off to the races because that's that's a couple thousand ducks, <laughs> ducks, a couple thousand bucks profit. <sighs> so I don't know. I feel like once you get that proof of concept, nothing else matters. Yeah, you don't got to keep watching videos. You, you realize what it takes to get to your goals and it's just a matter of like doing that stuff. Like we're not, we're not watching dropshipping videos. That'd be, that'd be hellish. I don't want to hear about dropshipping. No, I, I mean, I don't even like talking about it except what I, it's, I do like finding these products. I feel like it's interesting. I almost feel like when we find these that, you know, we're leaving stuff on the table because <laughs> stuff is going to be left on the table. Yeah. I think that's got to be accepted, obviously. And there comes a certain point when it's weird because you reach your goals with drop shipping. And then I don't know. You're, you're always going to see things that you could be doing, but, but should you be doing them? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a grind, but that's why it's great for beginners. Because you can grind no matter what, no matter what financial background you come from, no matter what your knowledge base is. I'm sounding like Gary Vee now. But if you, if you grind at the right game, it's only a matter of time before it works out. The problem is people grind at low ticket dropshipping where it's just you got to find a product. Product probably sucks. You got to run ads to it. And if the ads don't work, you got to find a new product, new ad set, whatever. You're just running yourself into the ground. This is just, it just compounds. Like you can have a bunch of products, a bunch of different product types, just like we showed on one store. It only takes one good supplier or one good product type. And you can just let the ads run evergreen. So as long as you just keep chipping at it and chipping at it, like people get results. I mean, I, I can't say, uh, I think there's maybe one student all time out of hundreds and hundreds that did not get a sale. And uh, that, that person was a special case. We'll say that. Yeah. Oh, have you been answering Danielle's questions as she asked this? No, question? no, no. I stopped here because I didn't want to get okay. too deep into questions. Cause she, she, she said she had a lot of questions. Okay. Okay. So why can't you sell the same items once you sell a store? This is if you sign a non-compete agreement when you sell your store. And if you're selling a store with Empire Flippers or uh, Quiet Light Brokerage or any other, you know, uh, common brokerage, there's going to be some basic non-compete in place. And it, it's obvious, right? Like if you have a slop sink store, you sell that store, the buyer isn't going to feel good if you turn around and you take all those same suppliers and you just start selling slop sinks on a new store again. So that's that's the reason, you know. But if you sell something on Flippa or whatever, if you, if you sell it without a non-compete, then you can go ahead and just start doing that again. But any prudent buyer will not want to do that. 
I'm sure you could probably get away with like making a profitable store and then like selling it on a, like I would say a lower or like a less stringent marketplace, like flipper or something. And then bypassing the non-compete and then just doing it again. Well, that's what happened to you, right? We bought a, um, a blog site from some Russian guy. Right. And then he turned around and like did it again. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think his, I don't think the other one did well either. But I'm just making the point. Yeah. If you're on Flippa, you, you can get away with doing that stuff, like a lower cost website. Yeah. And even if, store. even if there was a non-compete with like a Russian guy, like how am I going to stop him? Right. What am I going to do? Right. H hire a lawyer in Russia. Even in general, these non-competes are a bit hard to uh, enforce because you'd have to basically sue for damages and then prove what those damages are. And yeah, I mean, typically when we do a non-compete, I think you're more protected as a seller to say, okay, we'll never sell these brands again versus saying we'll never sell, or well, not again, but three years. Three years is a typical non-compete period. You say, hey, well, we're not going to sell these brands. Versus once you start to get into like product types or even like, I don't know, just like a niche, like you're not going to sell appliances in three years. Like, well, that's not, that's not fair because there's plenty of things. There's plenty of other appliances that aren't yeah. on this website I'm selling. Plenty of things that could be considered appliances as well. Exactly. So, so. yeah, we like to just cut it down to, Hey, we're not going to sell these brands for three years. And that's, that's enough protection for the buyer and enough leeway for the seller. Yeah. In my experience, high ticket products tend to be heavier. Freight eats into it a lot. What are your thoughts on this? They are heavier. There's going to be freight cost, but you should have the margin to support it and offer your customer free shipping. If you don't, then you have a bad supplier. Or you're just, you're randomly shipping to a super remote location. There's going to be times, yeah, like, you know, it's a good supplier, but if it has to go to some remote area in Minnesota and it's going to, it's going to cost a couple hundred extra bucks and it's not going to be worth it. Um, yeah. So you should be able to eat this cost no matter how heavy the product is. We've never had trouble with this really, unless it's a bad supplier. CM says he haven't, he hasn't gone to jujitsu in a year. Last time we did was in Iceland. He was in the group. Oh, he was in our group, I think. So Martin asks, how do you guys view products that are maybe $500 and less? I landed a supplier, but most products are around $20 to $500 at most, 15% margin. Is that even worth running ads to? Or would you focus on products at $1,000 plus? I think we get misconstrued a lot. There's nothing wrong with selling product like a hundred bucks, 200, 400, 500. You don't have to be only over a thousand. Cause the point we're trying to make is when you're doing this, you could set up your ads and you can bid low in such a way that they run forever. And they're, the odds are stacked in your favor. You just need to, you need to consider what your margins are when you set the bids and you run the ads. So if something is 200 bucks, 15% margin, that's $30. I mean, yeah, that sucks. But like you can, you can still upload, upload the products onto your merchant center and upload them to Google shopping. Just bid really, really low. I mean, you'll probably even get free listings right out of that, uh, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's what I got to say about that. But yeah, I mean, we make plenty of sales under a thousand. We made a sale the other day. Someone, it was an item that was like 60, 70 bucks or something. I think someone bought like 30 of them or something crazy. I don't know about that. Yeah. Where was I? I don't know. I guess you didn't see it. Yeah. No, it happens. Yeah. People will buy multiple too. Especially at particular things. People will buy a lot of. Yeah. But yeah. CM says when I first I got five sales when I first signed up with you guys. LOL, that was crazy. <laughs> nice. Daniel says, what kind of packages do you offer if someone wants more one-on-ones? 
Is there a link, Joe? Well, that's an interesting question because we actually shut. I mean, I guess now is a good time to announce this. We basically shut down our course. You can no longer go on our website and purchase our course. You go to buildassetsonline.com, buildassetsonline.com slash enroll. All the um, all the places where you used to be able to go to our course, you're going to find that it's not there. What we're doing now is a more one-on-one focused program that you need to basically apply to get into. So that said, Danielle, if you go to buildassetsonline.com slash class or buildassetsonline.com slash enroll, um, you have to fill out a questionnaire and we'll basically determine if you're a good fit for our program. And the reason why we're doing this is because we want to hopefully work with less people, provide them more detailed guidance. And uh, yeah, we think the way we're structuring it, it's going to be an even better program than it was. Yeah. I mean, because people that join our program, they get results. Like it's such a high percentage of the time. It, it's kind of ridiculous, but you know, we want, we want a high, we want to focus on high quality students and get people really the best results. So um, you don't have to be a high level student. You could be new to dropshipping, but again, we want to be a more um, exclusive program and really work with people that are serious about, about building an asset, right? Cause this is, this is what we're doing. You have the ability to create websites that you could sell for a multiple. Like Joe said, that that first year we threw up five stores and we've sold four of them. You know, one we keep that, you know, is, is worth a lot more right now, but it's like the, the return that you get by having the skill of being able to create a website that cash flows, it's, it's extremely serious stuff. It's life-changing stuff. So we need people to take that seriously and we want to, you know, just uh, work with people that are serious. So, yeah, you can go to uh, buildassetonline.com slash class. You can uh, see how it works and, you know, see if... See and if I, and I think it's a... Fa- I mean, I think what we put together is truly a fantastic offer because when you go there, you're going to see that we're really putting our money where our mouth is with, with this, with the way we're structuring the program. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say, but yeah, you know, you can be totally new, never dropped it before, or you can be, you know, have a successful store. Um, yeah, yeah. One student just sold his store recently, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting him on the interview soon. But it's a topic for another day. Are oh, you welcome, Martin? Joe Martin said I look like Sean O'Malley. Nah, that I, true? Don't, I don't see that. Yeah, that one's out of left field. You don't even have hair. That's what I said. I said I'd rather have his rainbow hair. <laughs> Back on Wayfair, clicking around. <laughs> Commercial signage. I got to say, I feel like if you bought this sign, this uh, magnetic iron, like I feel like Iron aboard. This looks like a cheap place that you wouldn't want to visit. Yeah. <laughs> They're advertising their iced tea. Fresh. Yeah, what the hell is this about? Daniel said, would the price be the same? I have to save up before, save up before applying. Well, we'll, we'll discuss, um, you know, what your options are and kind of go from there. Yo said, is it okay to go into a saturated market? How could you differ from other stores if you offer the same products at MAP? So this is an important point. There's less often saturated markets and more often saturated suppliers. Because, I mean, mean, if you... Let's take what what are we looking at here? Washers, dryers. There's a lot, a lot of people selling washers and dryers. A lot of them. But let's say, for example, 
if I was the only person online that sold GE, I don't care how many washers and dryers are on the market. I don't care how many other people are selling other brands. I'm going to make a shitload of money because I'm the only person selling GE. So that's how you need to approach is something saturated. Suppliers can be heavily saturated if there's just a zillion people selling them. It becomes not worth it. But if you can find a supplier, maybe they're smaller. Maybe they have less demand. But there's not a lot of people selling them. So when they do have demand, you'll take a, a, a bigger slice of that pie. Seeing some interesting stuff here um, in the food space that I never really thought of. You got these key, like these food kiosks, I guess, that you can move around. <laughs> Beverage yeah. kiosks, portable It's almost bar. like a wedding um, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Game Control asks, do you find that random specific products that nobody has heard of sell better? No, I think it's... Um, you could be in you can be in either lane. You could be a smaller slice of a bigger pie, or you can have a bigger slice of a smaller pie, and it could be the same amount. So if you're selling a, um, a supplier that you know, maybe there are other sellers, you can do things to stand out. I mean, on top of number one, if you're not competing with a zillion people, you could usually be more aggressive with your ads and show up on top, and you know, you'll just get sales by matter of fact that way. But you know, how do you make your listing stand out? Well, you could have a better offer. And if there's map, how do you have a better offer? You could do that through adding something to the product, like bundling it, free gift, etc. cetera. But I don't want to get into too many specifics here. <clears throat> What VPN do we use? What do we use? Why? Well, that's a weird question. <laughs> what do I? What do I need a VPN for? Are you using a VPN right now? Oh yeah, yeah. I just use it like for, uh, like, like for cookies. But I don't like normally use it. It's it's NordVPN. What is a VPN? What's the point of a VPN? It just like reroutes where you're going. Like it just, like I guess. Uh, What does it protect you from? No, it's just on certain browser windows. Like I don't want to be like retargeted for like for like the. Same. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying like the 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 mass appeal of a VPN. Well, they're always marketed as like um, that they can protect you from advertisers and things like that. But I feel like the real reason people get them is so that they could like watch uh, shows like, like if they, they can go on like UK Netflix and stuff. That's the only reason I've ever used one. Yeah. I don't I thought, like, could it protect you from like hackers or something? I guess maybe in like um, the government, if, if you were on like a public Wi-Fi, maybe it would be good. Okay. But I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Okay. Yo, said, what would you say the best niche you ever sold profit wise? <sighs> Again, I think there it's less about a niche and more about suppliers. Like back when we sold um, conference tables, we had a supplier that was giving us like 55% margin and free shipping. Yeah. I think that that one was by far the best. I mean, there's no there's yeah. no doubt about that. Yeah, but it's not to say that every single conference table supplier you get in with is going to have margins like that. Of yeah. course not. That was insane. I wish we actually like had access to that now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, but this is the same thing. Like it it was competitive. We were spending a lot per click. Like. We we're getting like twelve dollars CPCs and stuff like that, which at the time for us was very, very scary. Even now, I, I don't want to be doing that. But well, not always, though. But I guess yeah, to scale it, you're saying you couldn't. Yeah, to scale it was difficult. To scale it, because this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. With um, where is the question? 
like adding new products and, and stuff like that when sales start coming in. This was something that, you know, we had, we were bidding on, it wasn't really getting any traction, then boom, $5,000 sale, make 55% on it. So that was a game changer. We're like, okay, how do we sell more of this? Well, once you start climbing up that ladder and showing up more, it's going to cost a lot more. So, you know, start getting into text ads and start getting into more, uh, yeah, more competitive terms. And it, the, the cost per click was going up quite a bit, but we were, we were doing it because it was worth it. I mean, what did we sell like eight of them at once or something for like $26,000 and made 55% on it. So Copper Muncher asks, when suppliers send you dealer applications, how do you go about filling them out? Do you print them out or use a program to fill them out without printing? I just fill them out electronically. Sign them electronically, send them back. We used to print them out back in the day. That was like a big newbie thing. I feel like we did. Uh, like I, <laughs> I remember going through my old room and there were like a bunch of just supplier forms. You're like, damn. The old days. Nowadays, I would, I would never print it. It's a waste of uh, table space. EJ. We missed you too, EJ. How you doing? <clears throat> But yeah, guys, inside our, our new program, basically, if you don't make profit within your first $1,000 ad spend, we'll reimburse you the difference. So we're basically guaranteeing you're going to be profitable your first $1,000 ad spend. Why? Because we just see it constantly with our students. You do things the right way, you get set up well, you make profit. Daniel says, on average, how long does it take for new students to get approved from a supplier? Could any could be anywhere from that day. What's the longest we've had to wait? A couple months for like a really exclusive supplier. Had to like do different calls and also all sorts of rigmarole. But I'd say once they once they give you the once they give you the forms, that usually means okay, like you're gonna get in. You're not filling out an application and then they're going to like judge it. They give you a form to fill out so they can file you as a vendor or as a, as a dealer, whatever. And so, <laughs> so yeah, a uh, couple weeks, a couple weeks on average, because you got to kind of maybe follow up with them, et cetera. But once you get the forms, like I'm, I'm going to be hounding them down to get their products, you know, Upload them, start selling them. Uh, does blogging help with acquiring a different and or broader audience for your store? Uh, uh, it, it acquires more of the same people. Like if you have a bunch of, what are we looking at here, Joe? What the hell is it? Garm? Oh, I don't know. I stopped scrolling. This is sick though. What is this? Garmin steamer? Where? That, that, this oh yeah yeah it's a gar yeah it's a garment steam no, that, that thing on the right it's like a robot clothesline or a robot hanger oh huh yeah that's pretty interesting if you have a blog about laundry room stuff or you know you're just getting organic traffic through your blog for these relevant items it's the same audience that's going to be searching for the products more or less um so I wouldn't say it's a different or a broader audience. There are different stages of the buying cycle a lot of the time. But yeah, it's it's the audience you want to be selling to. But more importantly, well, not more importantly, but just as importantly, it'll help you acquire the best suppliers. A student who's doing really, really well for a, with a, with our program right now had a blog that he used to leverage his dropshipping store, get in with the most exclusive suppliers. And now it's like I was talking about very saturated, some suppliers in that niche, but he was able to get in with the best ones that are more exclusive. And uh, he's putting up crazy numbers. EJ 
EJ said, what about a what about an episode where you bring on a student that didn't actually make it and you discuss like the reasons and all? A student that didn't make it. Like I said, there's only really been one that quit that was like really trying and quit before they made any sales. But like, I'll tell you if they, if they didn't make it, the reason is they just stopped or they lost all their money doing something stupid. Like that's it. Is there anything else you can think of Joe? Um, no, I was just thinking, I don't really understand the appeal of that, of that. I, I actually see this a lot in comments and stuff where people want to see like the failures, but I don't know. It, it's just not something I understand. You think that we're putting on our success stories only. So it's biased, but I don't know. I, I, I got under, and I also understand that you might want to learn from people's failures, but I just feel like this business model is so straightforward that you just take the steps and you make sales. And I know we, because we've seen so few people not be successful. Um, I don't know. I, I just find it, I find it uninteresting. Yeah. I think there's less like hard failures and more people are in an in-between state of like, all right, they just got some sales. They're trying to tweak their ads. Like they're kind of, getting the groove and those people don't want to come on a show. Yeah. You know, like we try to do that as much as possible, honestly, when people like get their first sales and stuff, because they're closest to that failure line. Cause if they stop working, they stop, you know, working on things, then they're, then they failed. You know what I'm saying? Like for us, if we stopped working on our stores right now, we would still make money on it because everything is set up. Everything is kind of, going but when you're first starting if you don't call suppliers that day then you're not going to get any suppliers and you're not going to have a successful store and you gave up and so that so you failed this isn't this isn't like a business that a venture capitalist is going to fund where there's like a 0.1 percent success rate because it's trying to like disrupt a major industry or something this is like a beginner straightforward business model that you know, it requires more of your effort than it requires putting your money at risk. And right. that's why I think that um, it's like not – it's not interesting to talk about failures because there's like not even much that you can learn from it because of the nature of that, of, of the way it works. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's not like a Shark Tank product. Like it's not a crazy – it's not a crazy thing. Like it's just something that's really straightforward and, and easy to do. Simple, not easy. Right. There's nobody that was like failing and then they're like, oh, I did this and everything turned around and changed. It's like you failed because you stopped. You didn't call suppliers. You didn't get your ads running. You didn't work to, you know, figure out the initial problems with your ads. You didn't work to fix your website. Um, and if you do any of those things, you're going to get sales and you're going to over time be successful. So, I agree. It, it wouldn't be that interesting, but we have, we have had students on that, like just started. So I, I would reference those. Could low ticket e-commerce be used as a resource to fund your high ticket business? Or is it best to completely stay away from that business? If it was good, <laughs> if it was a consistent way to make money, we would say to do it. Wait, what do you, what I, what I just said was that you don't need you need more effort than you need funds. Like if you put in the, say you have uh, like, there's a scenario where you have zero funds for high ticket dropshipping. And maybe you have a credit card to buy the products and pay for like the Shopify subscription. And you're only paying for the products after you sell them. Say that was the situation. You could literally get the suppliers, put up a store and then do, do all your SEO manually and make sales in probably like six months without even spending a dime on ads. And this isn't ideal, by the way. But say you have $1,000 to spend on ads. If you follow what we teach, you should be able to be profitable on that. But 
the setup process to get to all this of setting up the website back and forth with the suppliers, uploading the products that requires a lot of your uh, like time and effort. So if you're doing what you're saying and you're risking your money to try to make money on low ticket drop shipping, like you said, you say you said you made 50 K in the past um, running Facebook ads to a fruits, a fruit slicer. I don't know if that could be um I don't know if that business model could be used as a vehicle to fund a real business model. You don't need anything to fund this per se. Like you don't need to do yeah. a real business model to fund this. Like if you don't have the money, then you should go do like Instacart or do some sort of like Uber, some service business for 60, 80 hours a week to get your hands on some of the funds and then pursue it. That would be my recommendation. I feel like you, the idea that you should pursue a risky business to do anything, I, I think is is silly. Yeah, and that's something that really I think messes with people's mental model for like how to become wealthy. They think that they need to invest a bunch of money into something as a risk, and you know it'll pay off eventually. Which is just not not really how the average person goes from having money to having like financial freedom money. It's you take the money you have and you put it into a vehicle that's going to be low risk and get you a return back. Yeah. And then you can just compound that over and over. And that's what dropshipping is, but it requires it requires work versus like a stock or something that I can just – or like an index fund that will just kind of go up without you doing work. This requires very, very low money to start up, a couple hundred bucks for the theme, for Shopify, for Grasshopper, or whatever. And once you make that first initial profit on your ads – it's just going to keep going and you're going to keep profiting. So you don't, yeah, you don't need to invest. Like you don't need to fund it. You fund something like Uber that needs millions and millions of dollars to have developers set up the framework and you put the money into ads to grow the company. Like that's what you're funding. This is just put some money in, make the store, get it set up, put the ads on, and then, you know, should be profitable pretty soon thereafter. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I think it's the different. The, well, no, it doesn't matter. I think we said all that needs to be said on that. All right. Cool. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. We're hitting the hour. People's eyes are glazing over. So if you go to buildassetsonline.com slash enroll, you can schedule a free call. See if uh, a coaching program is right for you. Again, we guarantee you'll be profitable your first $1,000 ad spend or we'll reimburse you the difference. So talk about funding a business. We're guaranteeing you put the ads in, you do the work, you put the ads on, first thousand dollars should be making profit. So go there, buildassetsonline.com slash enroll. And until next time, take it easy.